and more toxic ones. In fact, Monsanto Company, the manufacturer of Roundup, spent years erroneously advising farmers to exclusively use ever greater quantities of Roundup to control the weeds in their fields. And for years, farmers listened. Meanwhile, these weeds were receiving evolutionary pressure to select for a trait of resistance to Roundup. The Roundup resistant trait is now dominant in weeds growing in many areas of the country. The introduction of genetically engineered plants is regulated by the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service of the USDA, pursuant to its authority under the Plant Protection Act. Where, uh, where was the USDA while well, a weed problem that imperils modern agriculture practices was developing? In courtrooms across the country, USDA has been rebuked for having unreasonably and arbitrarily dismissed the environmental consequences of deregulating genetically engineered crops. In some cases, federal judges have found that the USDA could produce no written record that it had ever considered the impact on farmers. Thus, a federal district court invalidated USDA's decision to deregulate Roundup Ready alfalfa. The USDA is now awaiting further directions from a federal judge before taking further steps to consider whether and on what terms to deregulate this crop. Since taking office, Secretary Vilsack has promised that the new administration would take a fresh look at biotech crop policy. But the biotech industry isn't waiting for new policy. Chemical industry giants such as Dow, BASF, and uh, Sagenta are plowing forward with new varieties of soy, corn, and cotton. They're already asking USDA to deregulate seed varieties that have been genetically engineered to tolerate their own herbicides. In fact, the evolution of Roundup-resistant weeds, while well, a problem for Monsanto, has been an opportunity for other large chemical companies. The immediate consequences of the deregulation and planting of these multiple herbicide-tolerant crops will be the increase in use of more toxic herbicides. Dicamba and 2,4-D are more toxic than Roundup, and their increased use can only be regarded as a setback for sustainable agriculture. In the longer term, the herbicide resistance of the weeds themselves could further change. If Roundup-resistant weeds evolved in only 10 years, uh, could, could, um, could multiple herbicide-resistant uh, weeds be far away? I'm going to ask that question again. If Roundup-resistant weeds evolved in only 10 years, could multiple herbicide-resistant weeds be far away? Indeed, several species of weeds already exhibit multiple herbicide resistance. The development of, multi, of, multi, of more multi-herbicide resistant weeds poses a very serious threat to agriculture in the United States as we know it. The increased expense for mechanical and hand labor to remove herbicide resistant crops on today's colossal farms could be cost prohibitive, potentially wreaking havoc on modern farming. Until now, the USDA has deregulated without condition every herbicide resistant seed variety that industry has produced. Will that pattern continue in the future? Does the USDA have the legal authority to attach conditions and restrictions or even to block the commercialization of genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops? Will that agency use that authority? Farmers have a long term investment in their chief asset, their land. Chemical companies operate on a shorter horizon. Nature's reaction to farm practices since the introduction and marketing of genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops has created a temporary opportunity for chemical companies, an opportunity they will pursue at the long term expense of the nation's farmers. Now more than ever, farmers need a Department of Agriculture that takes care to preserve and protect the farming environment for generations to come. I now recognize the uh, ranking minority member from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I should have cleared this with the Chairman first. I I'm going to just enter my statement in the record, if that's okay with the Chairman. I know our, objection. Our, our member, uh, uh, Congressman Schock, has a statement that he'd like to make at the appropriate time. Uh, do, do you want to yield to him? I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman okay, from Okay, we'll enter your statement in the record, and uh, you can yield to him. Great. Thank you, we'll Mr. Chairman. Yield I yield to the member from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Um, Chairman Kucinich, I thank you for the opportunity to provide uh, these opening remarks. 
as a member of Congress who represents one of the 60 ag dominant districts uh, left in the United States. This issue is in particularly uh, great importance to the constituents I represent. I'd also like to thank our witnesses who traveled with us uh, here today uh, and are going to be testifying. Before I begin, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to insert for the record a copy of remarks by the Illinois Farm Bureau and the Illinois Corn Growers expressing shared concern about additional government regulation of our nation's farmers. Without objection. Thank you. The title of today's hearing uh, confuses me even more than the underlying premise. The attempt to link advancements to help farmers produce greater yields, become commercially viable, and better stewards of their land and the environment to some sort of habitat ne negligence is totally befuddling to me. The underlying premise of this hearing is that farmers across this country are not employing the best management practices on their fields. According to these assumptions, they have no concern about their long-term economic and environmental sustainability and are thus destroying their fields and the environment. With this view, only new government regulation can combat these weeds. I understand the purpose of this hearing is to reaffirm that belief that by some unnatural process, the use of genetically engineered seeds and the use of weed repellent have led to some unnatural superweed. Yet the facts couldn't be further from the truth. U.S. growers have been growing herbicide-tolerant crops and using herbicides to control weeds for almost 60 years. Since 1980, 90% of the corn and soybeans grown in the United States have been herbicide-tolerant, grown in fields treated with herbicides. Because U.S. growers have been using herbicides for almost 60 years, they've been dealing with herbicide-resistant weeds for more than 50 years. Certain weed species will inevitably become resistant to some herbicides, or any other control methodology for that matter. Neither the government nor the grower can prevent resistance from occurring. Rather, they can employ those best management practices which will help them stay two steps ahead of the next generation of weeds while remaining economically viable and successful. If the goal today is to end the use of science and technology in the industry of agriculture, I would ask, how will the U.S. agriculture continue to play a role in feeding the world's six and a half billion people? Surely we can't do that by going in reverse and employing practices which will put our farming community at a competitive disadvantage. In reality, I would argue the market controls already in place are more than enough to ensure farmers are employing the best practices to control herbicide-resistant weed growth on their fields. It's actually our farmers, not the government, who are more concerned about the development of new herbicide-resistant weeds. And it is this concern which has already prompted them to employ crop and herbicide rotation and other best management practices to combat any weeds at the first sign of growth. The farmer who employs these practices will lose less of his yield to weeds and be more profitable in the long run. And the farmer who doesn't? Well, he won't be a farmer for very long. The fact of the matter is that farmers, yields are more efficient, farmers yield more efficient growth from fields than ever before. They have done this during the same period of time which these supported superweeds have begun taking over. Farmers realize that overuse or reliance on any single product to mitigate weed growth quickly results in the need to use a new and more expensive product. As such, it is already in their own financial interest to roti rotate weed mitigation techniques. In addition, the agriculture industry realizes that it is the best interest to mitigate extraneous weed growth as they spend tens of millions of dollars developing these products. In order to obtain return on their investments, these companies seek the use of their products over a long period of time. Selling an herbicide product that proves to be effective for only a few years is not a way to stay in business. The laws of nature tell us that weeds will naturally become tolerant to any single mitigation practice. So why would we limit those practices a farmer may employ? What we should be talking about here is ensuring our form farmers have all the tools necessary, the most complete playbook to mitigate weed growth and not limit their options. The real question here today seems to be, how much should we be re regulating human behavior? And at what point do we say there are enough government re regulations and market controls in place so that we can trust humans 
faced with a myriad of incentives to make the right decisions. Will there always be a handful of bad actors? Absolutely. But does that mean the government should reach further into the lives of every farmer across the country with more regulations? Well, I don't think so. Do we tell a person how many calories he can consume each day, or how many miles he or she can drive, or how long he can stay out in the sun? No. Rather, we try to educate our citizens with all the facts available about the decisions they are making, providing them with the tools necessary to make the right decisions. But ultimately, those decisions are theirs. We leave it up to each citizen to employ that practice, which will best ensure his or her long-term health, or in this case, their economic sustainability. I yield back. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Kaptur. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank you very much for holding this hearing today. This is an issue in which I've been interested for a long time, particularly the exorbitant fees uh, charged for uh, charged to farmers uh, who use these various products uh, to try to control uh, weeds uh, on their property. And we've tried to find ways to make the cost um, um, more bearable. I have a bill to do that, and uh, we see how unfair it is to many of our farmers when if uh, crops are planted in Latin America, let's say, versus here, and the fees are different, what a difference that makes in bottom lines uh, here. We're also coming from the Lake Erie area, very interested in the long-term impacts of um, the use of, of these products on our soil and ultimately on Lake Erie, our life source, because of the uh, unexplained now growing amount of algal blooms that are on Lake Erie, which some are hypothesizing have to do with the fact that no-till has been used to such an extent that certain um, uh, minerals do not break down in the soil uh, in the same manner as if one tilled. And there's all kinds of theories now as to why we are getting these enormous algal blooms uh, in Lake Erie in eutrophic areas for the first time where we don't have oxygen in certain areas of the lake. So we're looking at the connection between field agriculture. I live in a soybean bowl. Uh, in the western basin of Lake Erie. And um, uh, so we're trying to really understand the connection between crop practices, water flows, uh, the health of the lake, and the connection between uh, herbicides and uh, the long-term um, uh, health of uh, both the farm fields that the farmers um, are stewarding and then the water systems that serve us. And I'm not sure anyone completely understands it yet, but we know that there's something happening out there that's atypical. So we thank you very much for uh, holding this hearing today, and we look forward to the witness's testimony. I thank the gentlelady, uh, Mr. Foster, is recognized. Three minutes. Uh, yeah, thank you. As a, um, a scientist and a businessman, um, I think what's needed here is a, a mature understanding of uh, the situations in which um, the socialized risks of risk of badly used um, mitigation controls uh, um, is something that really makes it best for the government to step in and regulate things. This is a very complicated thing. This, this is not an example of a situation where the free market incentives get the right idea. You know, for, you can look at situations like just vaccines and the develop and antibiotic resistant. Um, bacteria, you know, as something where there are big socialized risks um, if, if individuals do not conduct um, proper control and proper use of, of these agents. And um, the, other, the other thing that concerns me about just letting the market do everything is the long time scale for developing, um, developing um, agents that will continue to, um, to work as, as phenomenally well as the, the Roundup Ready uh, varieties and the Roundup itself have um, that well into the future. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm worried about is that there actually hasn't been enough incentive to develop a variety of substitutes for Roundup resistant um, uh, crops and, and Roundup itself. And, and so I think that, that that's something where we have to actually look at the science of this thing and understand, make our best estimate of how things are going to develop over time. And you know, in situations where um, you don't see the free market developing the right set of products that will have the, the huge, that will continue the huge economic and environmental benefits of, that we've seen from these, um, that I think that's something where um, the government actually has a legitimate role to, to step in and to nudge people in the right direction. Anyway. I look forward to testimony. Thank the chairman and yield back. 
Uh, I thank the gentleman. I want to uh, continue by introducing our panel. Mr. Troy Rausch, is that right? Mr. Troy Rausch is a fifth generation farmer from central Indiana. The farm is located outside Van Buren in Grant County, approximately 70, 75 miles northeast of Indianapolis. He farms on the same farm he was born and raised on with his father and two younger brothers. They grow corn, soybeans, wheat, popcorn, alfalfa, and tomatoes on their 5,500 acre diversified farm. In quality as well as reduce soil erosion, which enhances water quality. The use of glyphosate in a properly managed herbicide resistant crop system is an efficient weed management practice. However, management decisions have resulted in increased and often exclusive reliance on glyphosate to manage weeds in GE crop systems and are reducing its effectiveness in some situations due to the evolved resistance to glyphosate in some weed species. Ten weed species in the U.S. have evolved resistance to glyphosate since the introduction of glyphosate resistant crops in 1996. Glyphosate resistant crops are effectively benign in the environment. Gene flow between herbicide resistant crops and closely related weed species does not explain the evolution of resistance in U.S. fields because sexually compatible weeds are absent where corn, cotton, and soybean are grown. Herbicide resistant weeds have historically been a problem in corn, cotton, and soybean with weeds re with herbicide resistance are not unique to fields with genetically engineered crops. Weeds with either evolved resistance or natural tolerance will proliferate in any field in which the practices are used recurrently and ultimately provide the weed with an ecological advantage. The concern with glyphosate resistant crops is that the decision to use glyphosate year in and year out is accelerating the evolution of resistant weeds. Growers are already seeing the economic consequences from the proliferation of these resistant weeds. In Delaware, a study showed that glyphosate resistant horseweed increased most soybean growers' costs by at least $2 per acre. And in a study of 400 corn, soybean, and cotton producers from 17 states, growers estimated that glyphosate resistant weeds increased their costs by 14 to $16 per acre. To deal with weed problems in these fields, most growers responded that they would increase the frequency of glyphosate applications, they would apply herbicides with different modes of action, and increase tillage. The willingness to increase costs to supplement weed management tactics and weed uh, herbicide resistant crops indicates that growers value the convenience and simplicity of these crops without appreciating the long-term ecological and economic risks. Growers must adopt more diversified weed management practices, recognize the importance of understanding the biology of the cropping systems, and give appropriate consideration to more sustainable weed management programs to maintain the effectiveness of the genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops. Most of the weeds, most of the economically important glyphosate resistant weeds are found in crop fields in the southeast and midwest. And the number of weed species uh, evolving resistance to glyphosate is growing. And the number of locations uh, with glyphosate resistant weeds is increasing at a greater rate as the decision to spray more acreage with glyphosate uh, continues. In summary, though the problems of evolved resistance and weed shifts are not unique to herbicide resistant crops, their occurrence diminishes the, uh, the unique, or not unique to herbicide resistant crops, their occurrence uh, diminishes the effectiveness of weed control practice that has been, has minimal environmental impacts. Weed resistance to glyphosate may cause farmers to return to tillage as a weed management tool and to use alternative registered herbicides with different environmental characteristics. A number of new genetically engineered herbicide resistant varieties are currently under development and may provide growers with other weed management options when fully commercialized. However, the sustainability of these new GE crops will also be a function of how the traits are managed. If they are managed in the same fashion as the current glyphosate resistant crops, the same problems of evolved herbicide resistance and weed shifts will occur. Therefore, farmers of herbicide resistant crops should incorporate more diverse weed management practices. These practices should be encouraged through collaborative efforts by federal and state government agencies, private sector technology developers, universities, and farmer organizations to develop cost effective resistant management programs and practices that preserve effective weed control in herbicide resistant crops. 
I invite the committee to read my submitted statement in the National Research Council's recent report, The Impact of Genetically Engineered Crops on Farm Sustainability in the United States, for greater detail on this topic than I have been had time to present today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Weller. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Kucinich and members of the committee for inviting me to be a witness today before the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Um, I am going to quickly summarize my written testimony, uh, and I want to mention that in addition to the written testimony, there is an appendix of a paper that contains much more detail than uh, some of that testimony uh, includes. Uh, but basically, I am here today to provide testimony relating to the issues before this committee as stated in the invitation letter involving genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops and the environmental impact of the evolution of herbicide resistant weeds. Uh, additionally, I have been asked to provide testimony on the relationship between adoption of genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops and the evolution of herbicide resistant weeds, the rapidity with which certain economically significant weeds have evolved their herbicide resistance, the incidence, risk, and implications for farming and herbicide usage of multiple her resi herbicide resistance in weeds, and economic and other consequences for farming and farming practices caused by the evolution of herbicide resistant weeds. I will do my best uh, related to my area of expertise in weed science to address any questions that are uh, asked of me in addition to my written testimony. I feel the issues we face in this regard include the overriding issues of a need to farm in a manner that allows high productivity capacity of quality and nutritious food in a manner that minimizes negative environmental impacts. Uh, farming that is sustainable for the long term and is acceptable to society. In a broader sense, all farmers face the challenge of managing pests and introduce, introduction of genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops was a response to this in regard to weeds. The question before us today is whether these crops have made herbicide resistance in weeds such a problem that we have selected for what some people call super weeds, or what I say weeds resistant to a particular herbicide or resistant to more than one herbicide. The basis of my written testimony addresses the following issues. The positive impact that glyphosate resistant crop plants and the use of glyphosate for weed management has had on improving global crop production efficiency by providing effective management of weeds. Secondly, glyphosate resistant weeds are evolving within the agroecosystem by adapting to high selection pressures imposed by crop production practices, which is no different than in conventional crops or and with other herbicides. Third, the impact of glyphosate resistant crops on weed communities is not directly attributed to the use of the crop, but rather an indirect effect of the grower management of the crops and weeds. Fourth, the rapid adoption of genetically engineered glyphosate resistant crops occurred because glyphosate effectively controls most of the economically important weeds and simplifies weed management tactics, resulting in both uh, uh, increases income and other benefits to the grower. The widespread use of genetically engineered glyphosate resistant technology has facil facilitated greater adoption of no-till systems that conserve soil and energy resources and reduce environmental impacts as well as improve the time management for farmers. Sixth, the widespread adoption of genetically engineered glyphosate resistant crops has resulted in the grower deciding to simplify weed management to the applications of only glyphosate in many instances. This weed management approach results in imposing considerable selection pressure on weed communities. However, in recent years, grower awareness for the need for appropriate management tactics, integrated tactics that have been developed over the last 60 years in weed, by weed scientists in, in association with farmers has increased and growers are moving towards a better understanding of the implications of their herbicide use practices in order to improve sustainability of the system. Uh, seven, glyphosate resistant weed populations can be and are effectively managed by using other herbicides and or changing cultural practices. I feel, feel the issues as stated will be supported by much of the testimony we hear before this committee. The adoption of glyphosate resistant cropping systems have changed agriculture weed management 
or in the long term sustainable based on better weed control, better use of resources, dramatic increases in no-till agriculture to the benefit of soil conservation and improves safety of water. The important issue here is not that genetically engineered glyphosate resistant crops are the cause of herbicide resistance in weeds, but these crops are an additional tool in the array of tools that we have developed over the last 60 years to manage weeds in agriculture. There are challenges to be addressed when these crops are used, but they can be addressed in a proactive manner without jeopardizing this technology. The key in my mind is related to aggressively meet the educational and resource challenges necessary to implement sustainable glyphosate resistant based crop systems. Paramount to meeting this challenge is the need to develop consistent and clearly articulated science based management recommendations that enable farmers to reduce the potential for herbicide resistant weeds to evolve and to understand better the ecology and genetics of these and all weeds. A proactive, integrated and well funded educational and research based approach to better manage weeds in all crops, including genetically engineered glyphosate resistant crops, can minimize the widespread evolution of glyphosate resistant weeds and weeds resistant to other herbicides and the result and potential loss of these technologies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for offering me the opportunity to speak before you today. Thank you, uh, Professor Mortensen. You may proceed for five minutes. Thanks also for the invitation to uh, present here today. It's a, it's a profound, uh, profoundly meaningful invitation for me and a first one. The problem of glyphosate resistance is a real and serious one, and I, I won't repeat some of the things that have been said about the species that have evolved resistance, but it's not just a species count. It's also the area of cropland that is being affected. And, and the this is the first time farmers have had to deal with herbicide resistant weeds? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, we have, um, have had major problems with herbicide resistance for a number of years. Uh, notably, uh, for example, all of the common water hemp in Iowa, which is a lot, is functionally resistant to all ALS inhibitor herbicides. Okay. So this is not a new problem that we have been dealing with as weed well, scientists. Let me be clear, now, and we'll get, we'll get all the professors if you, if you want here. Um, so I, I want to be clear. So farmers were experiencing problems with herbicide resistant weeds before we had genetically engineered crops? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Um, care to elaborate, Mr. Wells? Mr. Buckeye? You know, I, I thought you had something to add. I, I okay, apologize. Okay. You want me to add to what Mike No, I said. think it's pretty, pretty, pretty plain. Um, so talk to me about the approval process. Can, can I add something? Sure, or, Professor. Uh, I, I think in my view that there is something quite, your, the point that you, you raise is a good one. Resistance has been around for, for a long time. I'm trying to remember exactly back, you know, but atrazine was, was a herbicide mm -hmm. that's used widely in corn. And it was, there were a number of species that evolved resistance to, to atrazine. What, what, in my view, is very unique about the problem that we're addressing today is that we have a crop that was bred to be resistant to a herbicide that it was before tolerant, that, that it was susceptible to. And that we now see, a, and people pay a premium to use that seed. Mm -hmm. And the seed and the herbicide go together as a package. That has not happened before. And we see 92% of the soybean acreage is of this kind of soybean. So the, and I don't know the exact statistics, but 70% of the, of the, or 65% of the corn and 70% of the cotton. So th this is quite unlike anything we've, we've encountered before in that, in that regard. And the scope is, and, and, and the consistent use of something that you're paying the premium for. And, and how, how recent, is, and I'll let you get in, I know you want to jump in, Professor. How recent has this whole Roundup Ready beans, Roundup Ready, how, how, how recent is this phenomena? Refresh my memory, because I talked with our farmers. So, but so Roundup resistant soybeans were released in 1996. Okay. And corn, or cotton. Cotton was 97, and then uh, corn in 98. So about 14 years, uh, these crops have been on the market. And if if they if you don't go that approach, what what is that? What what would the farmer have to do different if he if he what if he's not going to go the Roundup Ready approach? I mean, are you talking? You know, get the back when I was a kid, get the tractor out, cultivate, do the thing, well, run well, the tractor more often, till the ground more often. Is is 
Is it that alternative? Assuming they're going to rotate crops, which good farmers are going to do, is that the choice that, that they face? Is it that basic? Well, one thing I'd like to add to what uh, Dr. Morton, Morton said. Add to it, but then answer my question. Yeah, and then I'll answer your question. Uh, it's not totally true. It's true in the sense that there's never been a genetically engineered crop prior to Roundup that allowed you to use a herbicide in it. But in the case of corn, corn is naturally tolerant to atrazine. So in fact, we had a crop on the market, I mean a herbicide on the market, that the crop was in essence resistant to a long time before 1996 because atrazine has been on the market since the, about 1956, I believe. So yeah, but it was naturally resistant. It was naturally resistant. Engineer. The natural resistance is based on corn metabolizing the herbicide into right. an inactive form. The weeds can't do that. Okay. So uh, we did have some experience. So uh, and when we got the atrazine resistance, to me, we have many of the same issues with all of the different types of herbicide resistances that we've dealt with in general. We developed a whole toolbox of weed management techniques from before we had herbicides until after we had herbicides. This includes some form of tillage or even before tractors, hand hoeing, yeah. crop rotation. So you crop, and Dave is much more of an expert on this than I am, but certain weeds are more likely to be a problem in some crops than others. So you might rotate to a more competitive crop to get rid of those. So integrated weed management is the approach to deal with all weed problems. In the case of herbicide resistance, and it goes back to Chairman Kucinich's comment, yes, the, the approach from a chemical standpoint is tank mixes of herbicides. So in the case of triazine resistance, atrazine, we, we always use these chloroacetamide type herbicides such as trade names were lasso, dual, mm -hmm. And they, they're, they're all soil applied, and those got rid of most of the weeds that were not being controlled by atrazine. So in the case of glyphosate, we have seen an increase in pre-emergence herbicides applied. You can say all herbicides are toxic if you want to say, put it that way. But most of the herbicides that have come on the market since the 80s generally are relatively non lower toxicity than some of the older compounds. 2,4-D dicamba would be two of the older compounds. So tank mixtures, crop rotations, uh, addressing weeds with different management techniques is the way we've always dealt with weeds, whether they're resistant or not, so that they don't build up and become a problem. The, the novelty of this is we had this herbicide, as, as you asked me, it was infallible. Well, it wasn't infallible. People thought it was. They applied only that. You had Roundup Ready crops, corn, soybeans. Mm -hmm. Those were rotated. They used Roundup. Bad management. It wasn't the crop's fault. It was the management's fault. Okay. My feeling. Okay. So it's not as basic as I described where they, they're going to have to choose one option or the other. It's a comprehensive integrated approach is, is the best way to handle this all. Yes. And the. Because so, I just want to be clear. You're not advocating we, we, we ever, you know, farmers are going to use herbicide. I mean, if they have to go to something else, there's a cost associated with that. And frankly, maybe less, less yields, et cetera, that, that may be associated with that. So it's a, it's a comprehensive integrated approach. Well, and the one, one negative in, in the glyphosate case, glyphosate crop, resistant crops, allowed us to go to massive acreages of no-till. All right. So we met a lot of the rules and regulations about tillage. We may have to, as, as Dave mentioned earlier, some types of minimal tillage could could play a role in that again, and we have to consider what the econo the economic and the environmental aspect uh, uh, of those practices do you, uh, are. Do, do our professors and in, in our uh, in our farmer do you share the same criticism of the uh, of the agency that Mr. Kimbrell does, um, and, and maybe give me a little give the committee a little insight into the approval process both the EPA has for their herbicide and USDA has for the engineered uh, crops. Elaborate on that, if you will. And I don't care who goes. I'm, s I'm certainly no expert on, on any of that. Um, I, uh, I deal with the ramifications of what comes down the pike, of course. Okay. And yeah. I see the ramifications of what's coming down the pike, and that's my concern. Yeah. Professor. Uh, I'm 
very much unfamiliar with the specifics that are referenced, but I have followed this a little bit. Uh, when we are working with uh, regulated materials, we follow whatever requirements are placed upon us, but as far as how the agency behaves otherwise, I honestly don't know. Okay, let, let me do the one thing. Would, would uh, Mr. Mortensen's advocated a tax on uh, herbicides, I believe, in his one of his four or five suggestions. Do the rest of you share that? I mean, I, w I would point out that you know, the one sector of our overall economy that is doing relatively well is agriculture. Profits were up. We had a, we had a figure. Uh, net farm income is, is forecast to be 63 billion this year, 6.7 billion or 11 percent, almost 12 percent increase from last year. So it's one sector of our economy that's looking pretty good. Um, would you advocate taxing this, uh, taxing herbicides and putting that additional cost on, on agriculture? Absolutely not. Mr. Weller? I agree. No. And let's talk to the farmer. Sure, as long as the funds were properly allocated to uh, public research. Mr. Kimbrell? Yeah, I just want to, whatever the issue, yes or no, on tax, I think it would be a shame if that clouded the, the central point of Professor you know, Mortensen's, which is that we need federal funding for independent university research, independent university research to track the emergence of these weeds. We do not have that database. That's the, the database we all were looking for. And, and it seems to me that tax, I mean, there has, maybe there has to be some funding mechanism. I'm not, I'm not sure tax is it. But let's not forget that this is a really important area where university researchers could be invaluable and help.